Okay, I'm gonna get going because there's so much content to cover uh, in this particular workshop. So good morning, welcome to the Open Textbook Network Summit. Thank you for joining us for today's session entitled the faculty workshop in brief. My name is Tanya Groves and I'm the Director of Educational Programs at the Open Textbook Network. If you're not familiar with the OTN, we're a community of higher ed organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open ed. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu forward slash OTN. I'll be serving today as a facilitator for today's session, and I'm joined by my colleague, Craig Sandler, who's the communications specialist. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to share a few important details with you. The hashtag for the summit is hashtag OTN Summit 20. We're live tweeting our session, so please join us on Twitter at, at open underscore textbooks. This meeting will be recorded. Uh, the video and transcriptions will be posted on the Open Textbook Network's YouTube channel after the summit is concluded. Uh, the last several minutes of today's session will be for questions, um, and so you can go ahead and put those in the chat. If somehow we run out of time, you can feel free to email me directly. Uh, we're committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu forward slash summit community norms. So today I'll be giving our faculty workshop, the one that we offer to OTN member institutions at higher ed institutions all across the nation uh, and in Australia, because we know that awareness of OER is really still a barrier to adopt adoption. Furthermore, we've established that if we can get faculty to review a textbook, about 45% of them adopt. So normally this presentation is more interactive and slower, but since I only have an hour and I wanna leave time for questions and a little special thing at the end, I'm gonna go really quickly and I'm going to wait till the end to answer questions. Um, if you stick with me to the end of the presentation and I speak quickly enough, um, I'm gonna add some strategies for you all, knowing that most of you aren't faculty, instead you're people promoting open initiatives on your campuses. I'm gonna share at the end, if I have time, some strategies um, that, that I've seen that are really effective um, for promotion. So today um, we are going to talk about what the problem is, uh, what is the problem that we're trying to solve, what are open textbooks, and what can we do. And when I say we, I'm going to pretend now that you all are faculty. So not many people know that the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights actually has language embedded within it concerning the importance of equal access to higher ed. And when you read this, it's easy to think about people in other nations, developing nations, not our country, um, but we're talking about an issue uh, that's broader, that affects more of us, and it's certainly broader than textbooks. So I'm very pleased to be here and to have a chance to speak with you about issues that I think really concern us all. Um, while I think we all think that higher ed should be structured in a way to deliver us social equality, what we see I think far too often is that higher ed is structured in, in a way that only serves to reinforce social inequality. Um, and I think this inequality reared its ugly head most recently with the pandemic. And that's something that we, as we iterate on this slide deck and discuss as staff members, um, are really wrestling with. How can open ed um, help that? How can it help, help us to be more equitable? So we know that the reality of higher ed being more accessible to all falls far short of its goals sometimes. Because the lack of high speed internet disproportionately affects economically disadvantaged students and rural areas, students who now must rely on the internet to deliver education don't always have access to a working computer or to high speed internet. So never before, I think, has access been so central to our national consciousness than during COVID-19. And access to high quality um, education is often tied up inextricably with affordability. So this slide demonstrates how the burden of paying for higher ed has shifted from the state to the student. The purple line uh, is the state funding for higher ed that you see continues uh, to decline and the gold line represents the amount that students have to come up with. So the proportion of costs that students must contribute in 1993 when I was going to college to today has doubled. 
Um, and this is a slide that is localized to whatever school we're presenting at. So in Minnesota, my home state, the two lines interestingly have actually crossed as funding that students have to come up with to pay for their education has surpassed the state funds. But what I hear oftentimes is, um, especially sometimes from administrators when I'm presenting, but students can just work their way through college, right? I mean, that's what I did, right? That's what I did in the 1990s. Um, but really, that's kind of a myth because federal and state data indicate that very few students actually can finance their education by working only 10 hours per week. More and more, as state funding declines, students have to work upwards of 30 and 40 hours a week um, and take out loans to get through school. So, but I just mentioned loans, so they could just take out loans and pay them off, right, in a, in a few years. But that's also different than when I went to school. The most shocking thing about this particular slide is that student debt has tripled, tripled since 2006. The gold line is credit card debt, which is mostly evened out, as you see, and the purple line is student debt, which has tripled. Um, and it's not just student debt that's affecting their ability, students' ability to successfully make their way uh, through, through a degree. Sometimes they aren't even getting their basic needs met. Um, so consider this story from All Things Considered on NPR from February 2017 about a study at the University of Wisconsin led by Sarah Goldrick Rabb. If you haven't read her book, Paying the Price, I highly recommend it. Um, and this study looked at food and ho housing vulnerability among students. So really our students are living like students. And when you ask, well, what does that mean? Like they're eating ramen, right? They're not going out and spending crazy amounts on food. Um, but they're still not sometimes making their ends meet um, or having their basic needs met. So hence the evolution of CUFPA, the College and University Food Bank Alliance. When it started in 2012, it had 13 members. As of this June, it has 700 plus. So as you know, colleges and universities across the nation struggle to meet these needs, um, Here's a, a localized slide. I would localize this to wherever I happen to be presenting. Um, but so many colleges and institutions have these food banks. And I think that COVID-19 uh, has exacerbated the issue of food insecurity because food banks are overwhelmed. The students who counted on getting food from their school students, uh, their school's food bank forced are forced to look elsewhere. Um, this headline reads that food banks are seeing volunteers disapply, disappear and supplies evaporate. So college is really expensive and that alone makes it uh, less accessible for many. These are the major college, uh, these are the major expense categories for students. And of course today we're going to talk about books and supplies. So it's not because books and supplies are the most interesting things we can talk about, but it's when I'm speaking to faculty, it's the one cost that we, I happen to be a faculty member myself, can impact, and we're the ones uniquely who can do so. Also, books have a and, and course supplies have a disproportionate impact on the academic success of students, and we're going to see that uh, later. And this is personal to me. As I mentioned, I'm an English teacher. Uh, my undergraduate degree is English ed. I've taught English or literature for 25 years now. Um, and money, unfortunately, has been a central issue. When I student taught, when I taught high school English for seven years, and the uh, 16 or plus years uh, teaching college literature. So oftentimes money made the difference as to whether I was able to supply my students with the books that I thought they needed. Um, and at the college level, having taught online literature now forever, when students can't afford the big expensive anthology, which is there on the end, it makes a really huge difference as to how well they get started in the class. Um, oftentimes the books I wanted to use or I was told I would be using have not been accessible to my students. And we aren't just imagining it. Textbooks really have gotten more expensive. In this 2019 report, the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics says that textbook costs have increased a thousand percent. That's three zeros since the 1970s. And they've risen 88 percent between 2006 and 2016. And bundled access codes and digital titles, sometimes they can hide costs from students. And they, you know, the access codes can only be used for a certain amount of time, and then they can render the digital book useless without the code. 
So on your campus, you know, what do students spend? So the federal government mandates that institutions must put this cost. So you can Google cost of attendance. Um, and so this is just for the University of Minnesota where I work. Students are told to budget it between 1240 and 1440. Uh, the average for four or five years now has been about a thousand. But interestingly, what they're actually spending is more like $415. So at this point in the presentation, I would stop and say, you know, why do you think that is? Um, and I think there's a whole, a whole array of things. Um, because I think they're doing all these strategies. I know my, uh, my student, my oldest daughter is going to be a freshman in college. And the last thing she said she'd do is, is, is buy from the campus store. So they're already savvy to, to cost. Um, but you know, here are the, the myriad coping strategies. They purchase an older edition, they delay purchasing it, they never purchase the textbook. They might share it with another student or, and I've separated this one out because this is the one with legal ramifications, they download them illegally from the internet. So when you ask students, um, you know, what they, what the biggest cost challenges um, are, it's really interesting to me that housing costs are below course materials. And if you've ever been in a room with parents of college students, you start talking about textbooks and people just get angsty. Um, it's just a very uh, stressful uh, thing to pay for. So see if you can pick out all the things this, this young man has Carlson. done. Uh, right now I'm a freshman, so I'm pre-major, but I'm looking to study uh, entrepreneurial management and maybe a minor in management information system. Uh, I actually decided to buy only two of the required textbooks um, after kind of poking around and really asking people of taking the courses uh, because I simply couldn't afford it. Um, that's when I said I took out two alternative loans from my brothers, uh, that was to pay for the cost of textbooks on top of um, the tuition. And um, so I, I have two of the required textbooks. I'm sharing a third textbook between <laughs> two of my roommates and a guy down the hall. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, and the other two, I just, I don't really worry about because I mean, I don't have enough money for that right now, to be honest, but it, it becomes bothersome when you have to travel, you know, to another dorm just to read your own textbook. <laughs> um, but I'd say for, I mean, there's some times where they're like, I, I need the book right now. I can't, I can't give it to you. And so I just kind of have to, um, twiddle my thumbs until late at night when they're done and then I can read the book and then usually I get shorted on sleep or something. I think sometimes I've had to stay up as late as 3, 4, 5 a.m. and then go to sleep, get three hours, get up and go to class because, I mean, that's when the textbook was available to me. A lot of the times it was just you got shorted on sleep or you, you didn't have enough time to study as you want because I had to pass the textbook off to someone else that needed it. It's just kind of challenging because it's like, you know, it's, you, you kind of, you're struggling to get enough money and it's always kind of the back of your mind to worry uh, throughout your day that do I have enough money to pay for my textbooks or pay my brothers back kind of thing. So it's, it's difficult. I might actually end up having to schedule my courses around what my roommates and people that I know are taking because if they have a shared textbook, then uh, I might have to take that class kind of thing because it's, if it's something that maybe doesn't interest me, but it feel, fulfills a requirement or elective, I might have to take that because that's 200 less dollars in textbooks. Um, I'm so kind of shocked because I, I'm completely broke from buying textbooks last year. So I have to take out a loan and kind of manage which ones I'm going to buy. And it's just kind of, it always, it always, the second tuition, I call it, always kind of uh, surprises me. Just this past year, I, I've probably spent in the ballpark of $1,000, and I haven't even bought all of the required texts that they told me to buy. It's been, uh, yeah, been difficult. So the second tuition, he calls it. Uh, this young man did graduate. He got a good job. But he also graduated with 120k in loans, um, and he said, "You know, my buddies weren't all quite so um, quite so successful." 
Um, and so, you know, he did everything you could ask of him. He took out loans from his brothers. He was a medical research subject, whatever that means. Um, you know, he was living like a student. He was borrowing textbooks and still uh, the second tuition took him by surprise. Um, so obviously not having the required textbook poses an academic risk. We know this intuitively, uh, but the Florida Virtual Campus conducted a massive study during ma March and April of 2018. They actually did it two other times too. Of more than 21,000 students, these students participated in a student textbook and course materials survey. The survey examined textbook affordability and acquisition at Florida's public higher education institutions. According to this large study, the cost of textbooks and not being able to have a textbook really does impact students negatively. Um, you know, they're not purchasing it, they're taking fewer courses, they're earning a poor grade, they're even withdrawing and failing from a course. So, up to this point, it's been kind of bleak, but I promise you, it's all solutions from here on out. So some good news is ahead. So one solution, not the solution, but one solution is an open educational a resource or uh, open textbooks. They're licensed to be free forever and they need to be downloaded only once to be used freely thereafter. Let's see what the business model looks like for these particular open textbooks. So the model on the left represents how we assume all publishing happens. A publisher invests in a textbook, students buy the books, the publisher makes the money back and the profit and the publisher pays the royalty to the author. But there's another model on the right, a college or university publishes a textbook, you know, they might put out an RFP to their faculty. Part of the funding is paying the faculty up front for their efforts. At times, uh, early open in the movement, on the open movement, funding did come from the institutions or the outside, sorry, like foundations and government. But increasingly, institutions are prioritizing this and they're self-funding it. Uh, this model allows the textbook to be free um, and freely available to be shared, copied, etc. Um, so the publishing process could be exactly the same, including peer review and copy editing. So really, it's possible to publish a free textbook while also respecting the efforts of the author. Um, and these textbooks um, are good, uh, at least some of them are. So this particular textbook um, won an award from the Textbook and Academic Authors Association in 2019. And then you may have heard of OpenStax, 48% of colleges and 2.2 million students uh, were using free OpenStax textbooks in 2018. And this is the branding um, from Rice University. They basically set out to publish textbooks for the top 25 enrolled courses in the US. They were initially funded by foundations, but now they're a self-sustaining model. So there's one thing that comes into play with both of these models, and that's copyright. Um, because this model necessarily wouldn't work if copyright protections didn't, didn't exist. Because how many copies would we sell of a book if there was no copyright? Well, we might sell one and then a bunch of us would just copy that one, right? So copyright is important, um, but it's not sufficient in this case. It's not sufficient for people who say, no, no I wanna share these ideas, I wanna share this book. So in that case, we need something more. We need Creative Commons, which is a nonprofit that created licenses to help people who want to share copyrightable intellectual property. So when you see this symbol on a work, it means that the creator of the work intends the work to be freely used, shared, and all of these things. You can copy, mix, share, keep, edit, and use it. Or if you're more familiar with David Wiley's five R's, you can revise, reuse, remix, remix redistribute, et cetera. So the last thing that this particular model, this business model needs um, is the CC license. So here are the different license components um, of Creative Commons. The first one is attribution. The second one is non-commercial. The third one is share alike. And the last one is no derivatives. Um, and those different symbols make up the actual licenses of Creative Commons. And in a workshop, I'd go through each one, but basically, very briefly, uh, the first one is CC BY. It's the one you probably see most often. It just means you need to attribute it. The second one is CC Attribution BY Share Alike. So if you modify the work, you need to put the same license on it as the original work you received. But you can still do all those things, copy, mix, edit, use, 
Um, the last one is CC by non-commercial. So you have to attribute it. You can't make money off it. Sorry, my screen, I can't see this actually. Um, CC non-commercial or attribution, non-commercial share alike. Then CC by not, no derivatives. So you're not allowed to change it. And then the final one um, is the most restrictive. You have to attribute it. You can't make money and uh, there's no derivatives. Sorry about that. Okay. And that messed up my screen. So just a second here. Okay, um, so um, this next one is an OpenStax book, um, which has a CC license on it. Um, it's free and you're given all the permissions that we just discussed. Um, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but um, it's a myth that they don't come with ancillaries because some do. As you'll see, this OpenStax physics text um, actually has an instructor solution manual and some PowerPoint slides that come with it. Um, here's another example of CC licensing um, with TED Talks. So this one says you have to attribute it, you can't make money on the showing of it, and um, you may not alter it. So that last thing is no derivatives. I'm um, sorry, Tanya, Tanya, could I pause you for just a second? Um, we're getting a little bit of scratchiness in the audio. I don't know if maybe something is brushing up against your microphone. Oh, thank you for letting me know that. Sure thing. Yeah. So when we talk about open text, there are some common questions that we typically get. And the first is, where do I find these open textbooks? So we point them to the Open Textbook Library, a repertory of over 400 uh, openly licensed textbooks in multiple subjects, and we're adding to them monthly. Um, and the Open Textbook Library includes faculty reviews on about two thirds of the textbooks in the collection. The second thing is, are they any good? Um, well, that's for faculty to decide, um, but the reviews that we collect in the Open Textbook Library look like this. While all the books aren't reviewed, some many are, um, and we focus on honest reviews, not seeking good reviews. So even if a text doesn't necessarily live up to expectations, honest reviews will tell us where faculty could improve them, and because they're Creatively Commons licensed, you can improve on them. Another question that I touched on earlier, are there any ancillaries? Because I'm used to my big patch package of ancillaries. I understand that as a faculty member, but some, um, some indeed do come with ancillaries. This is again, the OpenStax physics book. You get a student solution guide, you get videos, you get a TA study. Um, and if there aren't ancillaries, you could consider having your students create some. So another question that comes up is, do these open textbooks really impact students uh, educationally? And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, so this article reports the results of a large scale, scale study, um, almost 22,000 students regarding the impact of course level faculty adoption um, of OER. And those courses that adopted OER saw a significant positive grade increase and a significant decrease in grades of Ds Fs and withdrawals, those are the Ws. But what's even more compelling, I think, is that Pell eligible students were even more positively impacted by the adoption of OER. And, and they had immediate and forever free access to these course materials. So as we've seen, not having money to buy course materials, as the young man talked to us about, really does make a difference. Having immediate and free access and forever or access to course materials makes a positive difference. So how else can open textbooks improve student success? Well, students who, mo who are most at risk of dropping out really need to see themselves as belonging in the school. And sometimes these students report feeling like an imposter. They don't feel like they belong and even small barriers can cause them enough to leave, can cause them to leave school. So here are three ways uh, in which uh, open textbooks provide more accessible, uh, inclusive learning. First is content customization. Second is contextualization and localization. And three is opportunities for innovative pedagogy. So let's look at some real life examples of these. So some stats teachers realized that the students really needed to be able to practice the Excel stuff that they were learning about instead of just reading it and then applying it. Sorry about my dog. So they revised this open uh, book and they brought the Excel spreadsheet practice together with conceptual learning. So here's an example of customizing the content to meet the specific needs of a student. I love this example. 
Um, so this is uh, OpenStax out of Rice University. This is their um, sociology book. Um, but they made a Canadian edition of it because think about the differences between the US and Canada. I worked with a colleague who taught, called his winter hat a toque, for instance. There's a different lexicon. Um, there's different governmental structures. Um, so Canadian students weren't seeing themselves in the text. So a group of professors got together and created a Canadian edition of Intro to Sociology. This is probably my favorite example. So Kelsey Merkley helped astronomy faculty in South Africa to revise an astronomy textbook because they wanted an astronomy textbook for the Southern Hemisphere so that the content could focus on stars that their students could actually see when they looked up in the night sky. Prior to this, astronomy textbooks were written in US, US um, or Europe, the Northern Hemisphere. So what a powerful example of contextualization. Um, and then we talked about innovative pedagogy as well. So David Wiley out of BYU taught this class and it was project management for instructional designers. Um, and he and his students, his grad students, took a project management textbook and they revised it and made it better to make it uh, fit instructional designers. In subsequent turns, his students actually asked, uh, added assessment items, they recorded videos of instructional designers talking about project management, and they continued to make improvements. Um, and even more exciting, when each term is over, the students then get authorship credit to go on their CVs and resumes. Um, this is uh, an example from Rajiv Jengiani. Um, with Creative Commons licenses, students can even help faculty create the test bank. So you see that his class of 35 students wrote 1,400 questions in the span of 15 weeks. So he shares his goals for students to achieve a deeper level of understanding, and he discusses his purpose, the method he used, the guidelines he provided, and what he and his students learned doing this assignment. And he's not alone. Um, here's a really impressive example of open pedagogy. So this is the early American literature anthology um, created by Robin DeRosa with help from her undergrad students. And they basically curated texts already in the public domain. Um, and then they added introductions, context, uh, discussion questions, assignments, occasionally even short films related to the text. And they're paying it forward and they're improving this particular anthology, which helps everyone. Someone now actually is adding in some native voices. So her quote, open textbooks save money, which matters deeply to students, but they can also create a new relationship between learners and course content. And if teachers choose to acknowledge and enable this, it can have a profound effect on the whole fabric of the course. So if open ped, if open pedagogy is a new term to you um, and you'd like to learn more about it, I'd recommend going to the open pedagogy notebook, which is a space for faculty to share, discuss and develop assignments, materials, activities, assessments and more. Um, so basically Creative Commons licensing enables free access to OER, including open textbooks. As students learn remotely during COVID, access to education really becomes even more important to stay connected and to continue making progress on educational goals. So as we've seen, OER provides these benefits. Uh, instructors can distribute OER as widely as we like because they're CC licensed. They're free forever. OER can save students money because you have to download an open textbook only once and then it's available. You can print OER out. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and it can be modified to be made even more better, to be made more culturally relevant and inclusive, empowering teachers to make any and all necessary changes for the good of their learning outcomes, their courses, and their students. And OER, as we've seen, is highly accessible and can be modified to meet diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. So, okay, I have enough time. So here's the plus of this uh, presentation. This next session isn't typically in the faculty workshop. But knowing that most of you here aren't faculty, and instead you're probably staff um, trying to move open initiatives forward, or maybe faculty trying to move it forward, I wanted to share some of my favorite strategies for raising awareness, educating and engaging staff, students, administration, and faculty in your campuses about the need for open ed. So this guy's face is classic, and the $1,000 TV stand behind him say it all. Books are expensive. Um, and what a fun way to raise awareness about affordability. 
so he probably couldn't sell those back, right? Abby Elder, one of our OTN members, uh, Abby Elder at o Iowa State uses these posters during Open Ed Week as a way to raise awareness about Open Ed. You can access them at that link on the bottom, and you, of course, they're, they're uh, Creatively Commons licensed, so you can modify them and take them and use them as you want to. She uses them as a theme display with information about the topic displayed alongside them. So there's one not pictured here, does copyright give you a monster headache? Um, and then there's information about open licensing and author's rights. Um, and again, these are all available for use and adaptation, but what a great way to get faculty members and students um, attention. I love this. It's a super low cost, easy thing to do. Um, you can have posters showing the average cost of textbooks per year at your institution, which you can Google. And then you ask students to write what they would have bought with that money. And then you post them all over um, for people to see as they walk through um, commons areas. This young woman said she would have saved the money and not spend it on anything. Um, so this is a very impactful strategy. Anytime you get students talking in their own voices. So this strategy gets at another question we get a lot. I said I'd talk about it um, more in a second. Can you print them out? Or, you know, sometimes when you talk about open textbooks, people are thinking like it's just a ream of paper and maybe it has one of those, you know, dividers in it. But the answer is yes, you often can print it out. Um, and for far less usually than buying a traditional textbook. At my, my previous institution, we went from a $300 chemistry textbook, we were able to print it out for like $33. So it was a huge cost savings. Um, but a petting zoo lets students and faculty and anyone else see that indeed these textbooks look and feel like real textbooks. And you can celebrate, celebrate champions and adopters. Um, this was taken at my former institution and we celebrated 50 adoptions by giving out faculty awards and t-shirts. I would have had OTN t-shirts, but we don't have any. So I had to buy CC ones instead. Um, and then we took this picture. I had a bunch more faculty interested in open textbooks after we held this event. So it was really good in raising awareness. And then this was our video, which I'm hoping doesn't play. Um, okay, it, we, uh, nothing is really more powerful than having students talk in their own voices. Um, so you heard one earlier. We created this one in two weeks with students um, and it was virtually no cost. We asked two questions. What do you think about the cost of textbooks and how do you handle, how do you cope with the cost of textbooks? And they went off. I mean, they had plenty to say. This got tons of airplay and it ignited um, a lot of conversation and discussion um, on that campus. So creating your own student textbook video and um, on, um, I think on OTN's website, it might be the community hub, but I'm not sure. We do have um, various examples of student textbooks uh, videos. Now, this is a deeper learning strategy and Karen, Dr. Pakula actually presented last week, but kind of I was giving you some uh, more surficial strategies. This is a very deep one um, created and implemented by Dr. Pakula at the Minnesota State System. Um, so, she has three tracks. You can author ancillary materials, you can redesign um, your course, or you can actually create an OER, um, our open textbook. Um, and so uh, it's all facilitated um, by different administrators who have been trained to do this. If you attend 80% of the scheduled learning uh, meetings, you create, submit, and update weekly work plans, and then you present your final work to, to colleagues. And then she, it's a train the trainer model. So the people who go through this then become the trainers and facilitators of the learning circle. And yes, uh, they are stipend. They do receive stipends. But this has really ignited on the Minnesota State um, campus system, across their system, a lot of deep learning and all these different tracks um, to help support those people who want to create ancillaries or redesign their course. So this is the kind of thing that at the end of my presentation, um, I would share with faculty. I would ask them to go ahead, uh, take a look at the open textbook library, write a review, adopt if a book meets your needs, then please raise awareness, talk with colleagues in your program and your department. Um, and then I would talk about, you know, how you write a review and how you get the stipend and how all of that works. Um, but as we know, we're all in this together, even if we're six feet apart. 
Um, but I would argue that open educational resources um, helps to give us some tools in our toolkit um, to battle accessibility and affordability challenges. Um, so here's my uh, email address. Feel free to contact me. And now if there are any questions, I will go to the chat. If I can find it. Yes, I can. Okay, let's see. Sorry, Susan, Sarah, about the, the static coming through my microphone. Um, okay, any questions beyond my, my scratchy keyboard? <laughs> Any questions about the faculty workshop or anything surrounding it? Oh, good. I'm glad. Anything else? Any questions about how it works? As far as timing, usually the workshop is given about a, um, uh, an hour and a half, and then we set people out, we send people out in pairs. So it's a faculty presenter and a partner presenter who talks to uh, librarians and instructional designers um, and any other supporting staff. Um, so that's kind of how it works. So the faculty member gives this presentation and then there's a partner presentation. Any other questions? Do you have sample language we could use to approach admin to fund faculty stipends to attend the session? Um, I do have some sample language. Um, uh, I am part of our certificate and OER librarianship and that's specifically one of the activities that we do. So I have a couple years of sample language. So um, I could compile that and share that, uh, Kathy. Um, it is going to be posted. Um, also, I will say um, there are definitely institutions that can't afford stipends. And so then it's like, okay, would faculty want a letter in their dossier, in their file? Could you host uh, a coffee bar with all the syrups? Could you host something else that didn't have stipends? Um, on my former institution, we ran out of money. Um, and we didn't offer stipends and we still had people showing up. I know that's not going to be the case at, at every workshop, but um, do you work with schools in advance of doing the workshop to incorporate data and customize it to that community? Yes, so we find out in advance where we're going to go and then some of those points along the way um, we would localize that slide. Um, we do solicit information from the the person kind of hosting it um, and there's even some other slides that we would add in to localize it and if they want us to meet with additional groups like sometimes we meet with student government. Um, or administrators and so yeah it really is important um, to us to localize some of the data. As an FYI, I've had faculty who wanted to attend to get the opportunity review book for the service portion of his RPT stuff. Statistics back. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, another incentive. Um, and you know what, I, I cannot remember who did it, but someone, I think someone posted a white paper. I wonder if it wasn't Abby Elder out of Iowa State. Somebody posted an, uh, a white paper about alternative incentives if, if financial incentives don't work for you. Um, any other questions? Yes, and I'm sorry, I did go through the CC icons uh, fast. Um, I would recommend if you're interested in, in learning more about that, um, Mickey, that you go to Creative Commons. Um, also, a lot of their, um, they, they offer a certificate program as well. That's all about their licensing, um, but all of the curriculum is available for free if you wanna look it up if going more in depth about the CC licensing was, was of interest to you. Any other questions or comments before we wrap up? Okay, well again, my email address is right there, grosz045 at umn.edu. If you have any other questions you wanted to ask me offline, um, I'm very willing to answer them. Thank you, um, Craig, for assisting me and, and pointing out the, the scratchiness. Um, and thank you, audience, for attending. 
uh, please feel free to check out the summit hashtag, OT, uh, hashtag OTN Summit 20 to keep the conversation going. Um, and thank you so much for joining today's session. Um, I will see you at the rest of the summit. There's fabulous sessions today and for the rest of the week. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks, everyone.